Hello everyone, welcome to the sixth Chebcast. In this one, we're discussing ghouls. We're here with It's Ghost UK, Seventh Outpost, and So High for Hentai. Hey. Hello. Hello. And I think a good starting point for ghouls is to begin with the history of the ghoul, because it's basically a North African and Arabian thing that came into English and came into fantasy quite a bit later on. So basically, the ghoul originated in pre-Islamic Arabian faiths as a demon-like being or a monstrous humanoid associated with graveyards and the consumption of human flesh. It was also a derogatory word used to slander people that worked directly with death, like grave diggers, grave robbers, that type of thing. And also for anyone who does like macabre things, like I guess a goth for an emo could be slandered in such a way. In Arabic, it also sometimes can be used to describe a greedy or gluttonous person. And the word stems from the Arabic word gala. I don't know how to pronounce that. I hope I did it right, which means to seize. And it entered the English speaking world in 1786 with a novel called Vathek by William Beckford. And this is apparently from an unpublished Arabian manuscript. It's basically about a guy called Vathek, who is a caliph and his fall from grace after announcing Islam. Because there could be no other reason why someone becomes a ghoul other than that. Uh, uh, actually, there was an, a note uh, with the origin of ghouls. Um, long story short, they, uh, back when, there were essentially like devils or like angels who would go up to the heavens and uh, take the knowledge from the sky. And that is, again, Islamic theology. It's from Exegete. It's not in the Quran itself. Uh, they would take the knowledge, they would give it to people, and then once the prophets came down, uh, first Jesus and then Muhammad, uh, the, the, the parts of the sky would be become closed to them, closed off, and they would still go there and, you know, seize the knowledge, hence why the, the one who seizes the ghoul. Uh, and they were burned for that, or, dis or horribly disfigured. As they fell to the to the to the earth and they couldn't go up to the heavens anymore and uh they were deformed and driven to insanity and that's how uh they became ghouls they started eating human flesh hmm. interesting um yeah about that vathek guy he basically went on to do a heap of funky shit with his mum, and i'm sure you can imagine what kind of shit that was was his name are you sure his name was vathek and not oedipus <laughs> Well, according to Wikipedia, it was Vafik. <laughs> well, I don't know. Fair enough. And yeah, he did all this funky shit to somehow get supernatural powers. And then he got sent to hell. And then a bunch of stuff happens. And at some point, we get to this fat guy who's in this picture here. That's obviously a ghoul because of his swollen belly. And that's pretty much all I've got on the history of the ghoul. Um... Where are we going from that? Because we've got we've got the history. Where what point should we start with? Uh, so, so some of the oldest stories on ghouls are from the uh, obviously you know the, the Islamic folklore uh, and just Arabic folklore. Um, one of the uh, one thousand and one night stories uh, actually many of them mention ghouls and ghoul like things. Uh, one of the more notable one is about the uh, history of Garib and his brother Agib. And uh, in that story, there's a ghoul uh, on the mountain, or rather from the mountain, and uh, he's essentially kind of like a troll. He's he's quite big and um, quite strong. Mm. Uh, and and long story short, people believe that he can like fell a thousand men or even a hundred thousand men. Uh, but the the protagonist Garib essentially uh, beats them up and converts them to Islam. After which they stop eating human flesh. That that amuses me a lot. Not gonna lie. Stop eating. Stop eating human flesh. No. Slap. 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 Okay. When it, okay. So what points are we, are we are we just starting like from top down? So is it going to be the bestial flesh eaters a uh, bit yeah. next? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, who's who's doing that? Um. Who wants to do it? 
because I've I've got my own points uh, that I can okay. bring up. So I can do it mm -hmm. if you want. So I wrote um, this, so I guess it makes sense. So moving right. along to the next point, we've got ghouls that are often depicted as bestial flesh eaters. So in many fantasy settings, for example, Warhammer and also Grim Dawn, as well as Forgotten Realms, ghouls uh, appear... World of Warcraft as well. Oh yeah, Warcraft as well, yeah. In all these settings, ghouls appear as basically some kind of undead that's a flesh eater. And it's not always clear whether they're sort of alive or undead. For example, in Warhammer, Nagash makes some ghouls while he's constructing the fortress of Nagashizar. And what, what basically happened is, is that he was fighting these local humans, and the ones that he hated the most, he turned into ghouls by forcing them to eat uh, human flesh and stuff like that. And then, like, over generations of this... Um, degeneracy they slowly become ghouls and because of the way it's described it makes me think that they're actually living creatures that are just really like malformed and stuff but i could be wrong yeah i i think that's the big thing that like sets them apart from things like zombies is that ghouls are essentially alive they're basically like a degeneration of something that was alive and theoretically normal uh, at some point, but has been eating flesh for a good while, and that's essentially what becomes of a, of a creature that, that deals with eating flesh. Mm. When it comes when it comes to uh, the whole thing with them eating flesh and with gauze and whatnot, uh, would you guys say it's more popular in fantasy and fiction for them to be alive or undead? Because typically, uh, when you look at ghouls, it's You'll have different uh, different uh, worlds and whatnot, different franchises and different settings that will have them as undead. But you will have some like in uh, Warhammer and uh, so on and so forth that will kind of have them as more living. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, which which would you to uh, which 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 would you guys say is the more definitive? I guess. I think I would. I would probably go with the. Um uh undead variants i think they'd be like more undeadish because at people usually just call cannibals ghouls they just call them like cannibals they don't really go for any other terms if if you're mm -hmm. a ghoul it means it means there's like some sort of transformation going on because there is yeah. like out of going on a tangent for a, for a side piece in D D, I i forgot what these are exactly uh, or like their origins but basically like some sort of guys who tried uh wizards who tried to become better but failed and olami became like an undead creature just wandering around looking at necrotic powers but just Husk. they mm -hmm. yeah the mad demon husks it had one it had a single eye it's some sort of weird creature that tried to attain power did something Cyclops? but then maybe it, it was on it was an undead that's the that's the thing you're reminding it, me it, of those of those one night uh fuckers from full metal alchemist brotherhood now <laughs> that's the, hell? the the, uh, the but, puppets yeah, yeah that also would eat people I personally, I personally like ghouls as this sort of weird thing halfway between undead and living because it it often results in some interesting mechanics. For example, in Conquest of Elysium and the Dominions games, um, the ghouls come about as a result of an infection. So as a necromancer, you basically put some kind of plague on a settlement and the humans there get transformed into ghouls and they're still affected by stuff like morale like they'll retreat in battle mm -hmm. i think that's kind of interesting but yeah it feels like zombies are more mindless and there was a very clear period of transition between mm. of, of that required death between a person and a zombie while transition to a ghoul does not have this like clear border of death uh yeah. more or less i would personally say they are whatever you would qualify something like a vampire as like if you would say that in your world vampires are undead then i would probably say that ghouls are kind of undead as well um they're not mindless but neither are vampires um, and I mean, arguably, liches 
liches are that are certainly like like more or less undead. But long story short, I would personally kind of be like if 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 the if the vampires are are undead and like they haven't quite died, you know, they were just you know, contract with with whatever it is that causes uh, causes vampirism. Um, and they they became vampires than ghouls, or sort of through a different um, action, through a different maybe ritual, something like that. They became ghouls, but I I still believe that they're so, something like uh, how should I say? Mm, they're more alive than undead, if yeah. if we can call it a spectrum, and I think we totally could call it a spectrum because it is somewhere between. The you know a zombie that was just you know or a skeleton that that's just animated corpse versus something that was degenerated over time so much that it became a a ghoul or or that was you know um has done so many evil things that it became a vampire or whatnot you know yeah. All I can think of is Schrodinger's ghoul. That's all I've been thinking of ever ever since Cheb said like between life and death. It's just Schrodinger's ghoul. Is it alive? <laughs> is it dead? Who knows? Yeah. Uh, Christ. Uh, I, I also, I look. Mm -hmm. Go on. Uh, sorry. Um, I looked up more into uh uh, uh what I was talking about. Apparently, it's not an uh an undead. It's an aberration. Mm -hmm. Although it looks like it could be undead, but yeah, it's yep. basically um. A, a, a wizard who was trying to de uh, delve too deep into arcane knowledge and got cursed and became a Nothic, which is uh, an aberration uh, and neutral evil, has a singular eye and just sort of weird creature. Yep. But the, the notion is that he tried to detain something, but got transformed for it instead. Yep. Mm. So I definitely say that ghouls, as a process for like eating uh, a lot of just. I don't know. Probably it's like eating human meats, which is probably mm -hmm. like an evil act in the eyes of certain gods or yeah. just something like that. Yeah. That that'll be, that'll be one way of a person becoming a ghoul. I want to. I also I'm, I feel like there are ways of making uh, something into a ghoul as well, but I'm not totally sure the process of that. Um, something that uh, something that I kind of want to um, mention. Is when it comes when it comes to like you know you got all your different examples. There is an anime called Helsing Ultimate, and I know this. By by extension, you've got Helsing Ultimate Abridged as well, which is infinitely okay. better. <laughs> that is just funny. <laughs> um, but you do have ghouls in that, which are basically sturdy kind of uh, zombie type uh, motherfuckers that you know just love love to eat human meat. Yeah, um, and, and they they are essentially like intelligent, long more or less. That's another yeah. point. I mean, they actually I want know to how to wear up. uniforms and carry shields. Yeah. Mm. The, the intelligence so, is another point I want to bring up. But go on, ghost. Sorry. Uh, no, I was, I was just going to say. So the, um, you do have like um, different mediums of them. You've got like the ones from Warhammer in the sense where there'll be like these great big beastly horrific uh, monstrosities, and you'll have ones from like Housing Ultimate where they're like uh, more advanced sort of zombies with riot shields, guns, and so on and so forth. Um, yeah. And they'll be made, and they'll be made by vampires. Additionally, on top of that, you've got uh, stuff like Tokyo Ghoul as well. But Tokyo Ghoul goes in its own direction, a very different direction, and it changes a lot. And I think it's it's worth mentioning, but I I can't really it, recommend it. I, I really wouldn't say they're not they're worth they're worth, too worth mentioning because. They're actually aligned with a lot more of the vampires than anything else. They hide in society. They kind of yeah. do like a bit of mind manipulation every now and then. There's even mm. like a, ter a territory dispute from time to time. It's like, hey, don't eat in my place or I'll kill yeah. you. They've so got like, messed up eyes. Yep. Um, and, and their biggest uh, note is that they have literal powers. Each uh, ghoul has one of four things. Something that has wings and can shoot. Some sort of tail thing that can have sort of like a spiral spike. Four tails and then like, I forgot the other one. Oh, it's like a literal tail. I don't I was, know how you fight with that. I was gonna say in Tokyo Ghoul, don't don't they also have like some ghouls that have a high society thing going on, like the hiding, but it's more of a high society sort of uh, nobility thing about them. Like, don't they have? Uh, don't, yeah. Isn't isn't like there... one isn't one character sort of like recovered? Like he's um, it's like a pit fighter or something, and he's recovered from one of these places. He's really I'm... mess. He's really messed up. I can't really remember too much of that. Uh, 
like at most there is when uh, Kaneki just got torch and stuff, then ate another ghoul, then gained like the uh, unique power of a Kakuja. Which basically, if you eat another ghoul and gain some of their cells, or whatever the hell that's called, you can gain like a unique power to yourself. Like, um, Kaneki, he has centipede arms, one guy can uh, just turn into a metal knight, and one girl can just become some sort of creature monster. It's more like special powers than the, the folklore ghouls, though. Yeah. Yeah. And and with it being like, anime, of course, it's it's it, you're gonna have five minutes of two people standing just w looking at each other, you know, as if they want to fuck each other, and then some shit happens. I mean, yeah, like again, they're just pretty much much anime. more aligned with anime, anime, anime. Uh, anime. Uh, so it's, it's come summer, back. So. Oh, yeah, let me let me try to cover the notion of ghouls uh, in like symbology, so uh, our viewers can get a little bit of that. There's so, also the intelligence point. Mm. Yeah. Um, so long story short, ghouls are kind of like... I, I am pushing that point, but there's a good reason for that. So ghouls are kind of like vampires. You know how vampires uh, drink human blood, right? The point of vampires, and I mean, it's especially, it's especially like uh, real with, with Bram Stoker's novel, uh, where he, like, th the point of, of vampires was to show essentially, like, like corrupted high-class society. And it wasn't just to make the point that high-class society is corrupted, but rather that there are, you know, individuals in the high-class society who are utterly corrupted, who just, you know, leech off of others, who brainwash uh, those below them to worship them or, you know, make them into thralls what not and whatnot mm. um and uh and 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 only like like way 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 later things came that they can be killed with silver bull bullets etc etc um but there are a lot of notions about how a vampire can be killed uh such as you know or or what they're scared of such as you know silver such as garlic Allegedly, they're afraid of those. Uh, running water uh, and holy water. Uh, all of those are propositions about purity. Running water is the only th type of water you can find in the wild that can be clean. Doesn't always have to be, but usually is clean. Can I quickly uh, interject? So long as it's on subject, sure. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, aren't, like, uh, objects of religious affinity also, like, uh, mm -hmm. like a cross, for example, can't they, yeah. aren't they also used against vampires and whatnot? Yeah, 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 I, I was getting there. Uh, it's, it's all, it's all the notion of, like, purity and holiness. Uh, holy water, you know what holy water is? In most religions, it's water plus salt, and then you pray over it. Mm. And salt is the most basic means of preserving food from germs you can find out of there. Maybe there have been something else, but like that's the, 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 the most basic means I know that every culture knows in the world. So salt, etc, etc. Um, and, you know, holy water, as I've said, um, holy, you know, things which also indicate purity. Uh, and and how many religions in the especially all the religions have the notion of like ritual washing yourself to keep yourself pure mm. uh even yet yeah, i mean even christianity but i would say that islam and uh and the um and the other religions uh take it a bit further as in in the middle eastern world but i'm that that's beyond the point uh they're all things of like purity and ghouls as well as vampires the, the point of them is being impure in various different ways sin among other things was essentially a thing of impurity so um the the, the reason why you would slander a person who deals with uh like burying the dead with the notion of with, with the name of a ghoul is because you know they're impure due to the fact that they deal with ghouls. Would it also would it also be something to say in regards okay. to would it also be something to say in regards to their uh, let me find it because they are uh they, the name st uh, stems from the Arabic word gala which means you know to seize so they are seizing yeah. they are they are taking 
Yeah. And yeah. with and with how they are, they're not just greedy, but they're also quite gluttonous as well. You know, which are two yeah. two of the seven yeah. sins. So with yeah. them, they are they are kind of personifications of that yeah. of sin. It's, it's, it's not just that you're that you're eating so much. It's it's that you're eating the wrong things. You're eating human flesh, right? Uh, and and that makes you unclean. Hence why you know there's this. How should they say this? Um, a lot. There's so much unclean stuff about you that you your your appearance changes. And because the you know appearance and like the features of all these monsters are of course. Um, like fantasy things, they're metaphors. Like yeah, yeah. you won't find a real fucking vampire, but like you do know that like you know Vlad the Impaler like did exist. Like there were people who uh, there are people out there who who quote unquote bleed the people under them dry. There are you know people out there who quote unquote you know deal with human flesh or sometimes even eat it. Uh, and and of course they won't look like ghouls in the real world, but. It's kind of a bit of a how should I say it warning about that. Can can something be mentioned in regards to you know like how you, uh, France had the revolution where they basically put a lot of their upper class upper classes to the chopping block? Would that surely that would relate to this in a sense? It's a cautionary tale to you know not be greedy to that extent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Among other things, that and. Um... It's it's yeah it's it's like it's like the various forms of how you can you can uh, churn whatever uh, it is that's that 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 you're into that like turn it askew so like if you have like a hierarchy of like nobility etc to if 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 the no nobility is like false and evil then it's a vampire if the your appetite turns sour and you start eating bad things and you become a ghoul you know that's a really I mean, interesting this, point me me with a mcdonald's i'm in this picture and i don't like it <laughs> uh i mean you you, you don't exactly become a, a ghoul like literally but like you're going to to like feel disgusted in yourself you know and you are going to be i'm in this picture and i don't like it you know <laughs> so, like, like ghouls and uh. such things they're like they're like a cautionary tale in the end, I, because they they show like a pattern of reality, like all of those those stories show some kind of pattern of reality. It's about understanding it. Thinking about like ghouls and just kind of reflecting about it more, I feel like it uh, ghouls are more collide, uh, tied to gluttony and how it could be yeah. like one effect that could happen to them. Yeah, yeah. Touching on the cautionary tale thing, um, we have someone from North Africa in our Discord. And I asked them about ghouls and like in the hopes of finding out more and they weren't able to give me anything concrete, like, you know, a story or something, but they were able to speak about them just in general terms. And yeah, mm. like ghouls are often used in their culture as like a cautionary thing. Like don't walk out into the desert because the ghouls are going to get you to like keep children safe from dying in the sands yeah. or whatever and um, stuff like that. I do. I must. I must say, when it comes to African like mythology and whatnot, they are very weird. <laughs> like uh, you may realize, a lot of cultures are quite weird. If you it's... ask them about their mythology, I know. I know. I know that's a general thing. Like, I, I, you're gonna have different cultures. They're gonna have different beliefs, and there's gonna be reasons and things from that. But for me, like when it comes to Africa, they just have some very weird ones. Like, I mean, it's well, don't they? On. Don't they? What about uh, like? people putting babies on like red hot shovels because of fairy shit like in scandinavia that's pretty weird too isn't it okay yeah, yeah no that, that is pretty weird <laughs> true uh, i think uh so among other things there are well in my education i have uh encountered essentially or, or rather i was told about a a tribe in africa that was uh, pretty ample on the cannibalism thing mm. uh allegedly they've all died out because they, they essentially ate a person that had uh, Kreutzfeld Jakob disease. Oh, no. Uh, Good old prime. Coming back to that, you know, I, I believe I'm qualified to talk about it. Uh, so if you eat the flesh of all the people, or eat... But that's just like, like why you don't do that, IRL. Um, 
eating the flesh of other people is very inclined to produce uh, or just to have the prions that were in their body uh, get get into yours. And it's just like all, all kinds of nasty stuff that can uh, cause disease. For example, you know, the well-known prions and the Kreutzfeld Jakob disease, which essentially degenerates your brain over time. Uh, it's one of the things that may happen to you. The other is, of course, uh, if you eat uh, a, a food from like a farm that was fertilized with hum human feces, you're very likely to get the many uh, bugs and, and the many you know parasites that uh, transfer directly from human to human. Yep. Uh, hence why you literally never, never um, should fertilize the earth with human feces ever. Yeah, we, we touched on that a bit during the Zombies podcast. If we mm -hmm. remember way back, it's ghost. We talked about yeah. like all that stuff. And yeah, like heaps of cultures have suffered badly from cannibalism, like mm -hmm. in, um, I think it was... No, it wasn't Indonesia, maybe Papua New Guinea. They were like cannibalizing people over there and they kept getting this like laughing disease called Kuru, where they basically yes. just- Yes, yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Um, do they have cannibalism in the Philippines? Like I know in the Philippines that they do have some, they do have like some stuff going on, but in regards to sort of with ghouls and whatnot, do they have uh, cannibalism? Not sure. You mean, are, are they eating each other? I mean, Philippines is like 90% Catholic, I'm pretty sure. It's not... <laughs> okay, then. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure they're they're not eating each other. I'm pretty sure of that. Do you mean, like, just those kind of, like, very primitive societies north of Australia generally? Uh, yes. I've... Like, once, 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 once around that area uh, that are, of the world that are kind of just left to their own devices? Well... I believe the reason they did eat meat, like cannibalize people, is because it was like scarce in their environment because they live on islands and stuff and, you know, like it wasn't something that was all that common in their diet that they desperately needed. So they'd just eat people if they came across people. But, you know, I don't know this yeah. as a fact. It's just stuff I've heard. So don't write an essay with me as the source or something. <laughs> We're we're already gonna get in the comments. You guys are wrong. This is what this 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 this. I mean, this. I mean by all means, like if you feel that we have made any mistake with regards to our factology, then by all means, feel free to point it out in the comments. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's fine. Um, am I allowed to quickly go about the intelligence point? Uh, yeah, sure. All right, cool. So, in all of those examples I listed, Warhammer. Forgotten Realms and Grim Dawn. Uh, the ghouls are intelligent, so they're not like a mindless zombie. They're capable of forming societies, having structures like, for example, in Warhammer. Um, there's this ghoul guy who's like somehow punished by Nagash or something to live in like a cave with his other ghouls. And he's like the, the ghoul king sort of thing. And in the story I read, the main character goes and like communicates with these ghouls to try and get them on her side, and she does succeed. So they're like they're an entity that's capable of being talked with, which is very different to most undead. The other thing is that something that makes me think that they're living is that they need to eat. Like you don't have a skeleton that needs to eat flesh to sustain itself. But yeah. ghouls need to eat, so in my mind that makes it like they must be living in some way to require that fuel. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that uh, ghouls are kind of like addicts in a way, uh, if we follow up on the notion that like they have been doing something for a, such a long time that they're essentially, you know, the, their flesh morphed to become this uh so i think they would be like addicts there are people who deal with their addiction better and there are those who deal with it worse and uh, most of them i think you should be able to talk to but not all of them would will provide a a 
an enlightening conversation, let's say. <laughs> See, I'm I think thinking... it would be the same with ghouls. I'm just thinking of like a ghoul right now. After after you said like when it comes to the to them being crack addicts, it's it's, it's all I can is a all I can think of is a ghoul munching on someone's uh, leg just on top of a tombstone in a dark graveyard. There's a bit of mist and whatnot, and all I can think of is just this this ghoul being being an being just a completely meffed out mad lad. Just there going. Oh, yes, yeah. yeah, no. that's more or less what it is. I mean, they've. They've, let's say, engaged in the forbidden stuff, so you can, in a way, think of them that way. Uh, and, and they've engaged in it so much, they've become addicted. Uh, if you look at a meth addict that's been through meth for quite some time, and you set them next to a ghoul, you know, it's, it's not a very long way, let's say. You know, it's not a very long way. Yeah, it's just oh, I'm just thinking. I'm just thinking of the pair of them. Like, isn't the typical sort of um, stereotype of long sort of uh, long meth use? Isn't it like your nostrils are messed up? You're quite thin, um, like you're quite gaunt, uh, malnourished, quite skittish. Yeah. Like, uh, I think uh, isn't it the case where a lot of your sort of expression or emotion has just kind of left you a bit, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, stuff like that. Like you're just kind of like a shell of a person. Yep. Yeah. Pretty much. By the way, I looked up the Kuru, and um, basically the reason they ate the the human flesh is it was a part of a ritual done mm. during the mourning process for deceased family members. So they'd basically like cook and eat their dead relatives to symbolize respect and mourning. So that's why they did it. Yeah, isn't that... Um... Isn't that kind of like a common uh, thing when it comes to cannibalism? Like, like when it comes to sort of, if it's if it's people you respect, you eat them, you're taking their strength and so on and so forth. If it's somebody that if it's something that you're fighting against, then you eat them, you shit them out, <laughs> give them the, give them the middle finger and say fuck you. What you're gonna do? I'm just I'm just eating your mate. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> it, goes, it goes both ways. <laughs> yeah, it does. Uh, it's 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 weird in that regard, because yeah. on the on the it, it seems to be that it's either one extreme or the other. Like there's there's not a lot of in between, is there? It's either it's either respectful or it's not respectful. Yeah, uh, it's either respect or just necessity. You know, I don't think yeah. you would eat another person if you had a choice not to. Mm. Of course, in like war and stuff, like you know the siege of Stalingrad, I believe, while the city was surrounded by Germans cannibalism occurred within the city because all the supplies were cut off for months yep i'm just yeah i'm just i'm just picturing that like, i mean christ imagine imagine a bunch of um russians just coming at you with like bits of meat ha- hanging out their mouths because they because i've just eaten kalashnikov <laughs> damn yeah that would yeah. suck <laughs> I mean, such an event happened, but it had to deal with the poison gas. I believe it was uh, around the time of World War One. Oh yes, uh, yes. Yeah. Oh, f- uh, the, um, oh, what? Well, didn't Sab- Sabaton did a um a yes. song about that? Oh, what's it bloody called? Uh, uh, let me find it. Let me find it. Uh. Attack of the Dead Men. That's it. Uh, what's the what was the place of the war? I think it doesn't it have it in the song. Uh I'm pretty sure. Um It's a battle battle of World War One that took place at a Soviet fortress in northeast Poland. Uh, there were a mixture of Russian and Polish soldiers, mostly Russians, because there wasn't much of a Poland going on at the time. Um, it's uh, yeah. It's, it's isn't it also 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 awake? Also, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's yeah, yeah. Long story short, uh, German Empire folks retreated after seeing the uh, the 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 Russian soldiers essentially rise up from the dead after the the uh after the gas attack still coughing out their lungs and still marching at the enemy shooting so uh mm. they uh 
And I think I would retreat as well. I think wasn't, I would wasn't, it, wasn't it the case where the Germans were that terrified and they were running, they were retreating so fiercely that they were even trampling each other just to get away, despite despite the massively outnumbering the the Russians that you know were, yes. yeah, yikes, yeah. damn. See, a lot can be said about Russians, and there's a lot of memes that can be done about communism. But I think I think out of I think out of like all of the different peoples and cultures in the world, I think Russians are stereotypically just hard bastards by default. Yeah, they're really tough. Mm -hmm. Another thing that is kind of interesting is that chimpanzees will do cannibalism. Like, oh yeah, 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 when... they will. There's a video on the internet of them murdering their their leader and then just eating him. Mm. The thing, the thing with that though, almost um, and correct, correct me if I'm wrong with this, but almost every anim, every uh, predator, every meat eater in the world does participate in cannibalism to some degree. Um, lions, baboons, etc., uh, polar bears, etc., etc. They will eat the offspring of others of the of their same species, or at least kill, uh, or at least or at least kill. That's no, that's the point. Uh, a lion is very likely to kill the cubs of the alpha once he takes the position, essentially, mm. for the point of like like him having the cubs instead of the others. Yeah, yeah. but uh, they 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 will like, like if if they need to, they will resolve to eating each other. Like they have little yeah. qualms about that. They that they will do that. Yeah. So, and rats as well. They don't bat an eyelid over that kind Obviously. of thing. Oh yeah. 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 Which is actually really funny. Like, people want live traps, but what happens is if you have live traps, like, say, a bucket, and the rats are falling in there, and they just all murder each other in there, and it's, like, totally disgusting and brutal. So it's kind of I mean, more it's, humane. It's also the rat problem, don't it? <laughs> yeah, it does. But it's not humane to have the, the rats living inside the trap if there's going to be more than one rat in there, because they will mm. kill each other. Yeah. Um, with with the whole sim uh, s symbolic symbology, all of the, all of that, the world goals. Surely we can attribute attribute this to a lot of other stuff. But like it, with with animals, with rats eating each other, with uh, with humans doing ca uh, performing cannibalism, with people being greedy and whatnot. Uh, what really? If <sighs> I don't word it. If there was an animal that was to sort of more represent the traits of a ghoul, in the sense of you know like all the cautionary stuff. What would you guys say would be the most likely one? Because this, this uh, people can always use this particular thing for world building purposes. I Either. think a rat is the most ample. Second one could be a hyena. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel like I feel like a hyena humans. would be a lot more would be a lot better because hyenas they will eat anything. They will eat the they will have maggot infested, uh, rotting flesh. They they will just. If 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 they see it and they like it, they'll eat it. They don't give a shit. They will yeah. have it. I mean, Chris, they'll, they'll eat I, stuff that lions won't eat. Yeah, I I could totally say something along the lines of like like farm animals, but they're tame and mm. ghouls are not. I would choose the chimpanzee because they go around the the treetops catching other monkeys and like eating them alive and stuff. That seems pretty ghoul like to me. Uh, they set up ambushes as well. Like they, yeah. they uh, like they'll have like different pe uh, members of the group performing different roles, but they will like they'll they'll catch uh, prey and then they'll just rip it to pieces. Plus, they kind of look like ghouls with their hunched posture and all that stuff. Mm. I, I wonder, do you, do you reckon? I'm actually trying to think now. Do they have ape um, like different species of ape uh, animals in Arabia, like around? Um, I don't in the, think in so. The Arabic Maybe a monkey, but I don't think there's any big apes there. I mean, maybe they had Bigfoot once or something. Bigfoot maybe. was everywhere, apparently. It's a big. I mean, Bigfoot was. Um, I'm trying to remember the specific one. I think it's Gigantopithecus yeah. uh, that that people sort of say that Blackfoot uh, that Bigfoot is. But the the thing with that though is that we still don't know a lot in regards to that. So. Yeah, plus he was just in one specific area of China, I believe. Whereas, like, these sightings of big apes are basically worldwide. There probably yeah, yeah. was some kind of, like, big ape that was terrorizing ancient human populations and it's kind of, like, being put into our genes or something that we fear other big apes or something. 
we do we do we do have that when it comes to tales of giants and so when it comes to, when it comes to tales of giants you, they again correct me if i'm wrong but when it comes to tales of giants you'll typically find that these originate from sort of like uh, people native to d- different regions of the world and when typically europeans would would go to these places um more advanced europeans would go to these places the uh, people of the natives of these places would be kind of like much smaller and much more uh, petite in size compared to the invaders. So, and with these people coming in and doing whatever they want, you know, they'd be killing people, they'd be setting up shop and whatnot. It it would it would cause the natives to kind of like spread oral uh, rumors and legends of oh yeah, you got these horrible big giants that come and they do all this and this and this and this and this. You've so, but I've, I, and then as time goes on, the uh, five, the little five feet to what five 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 six six feet whatever people that changes and it becomes oh yeah they're ten feet tall they're twenty feet tall they're bigger than a building they're so big they blot out the sun yeah um that's not I mean these these stories they were older than actual civilization so I'm one hundred percent certain that stories of giants do not come from uh from like civilization people visiting. You know, uh, native tribals. I'm 100% right, okay, sure. Okay. That. Um, One okay. thing about Africa right now um, mm. that's quite relevant to ghouls. Do you know about the the Bantu people and the Pygmy people? I've heard of the Pygmy people. Yeah. The Bantu Basi- people, I think I've heard in reference, but I don't know a lot about either. Basically, like the Bantus are a kind of genetic group of Africans that are basically like very widespread. I think. You know, when you stereotypically think of an African person, they're like Bantu. And the the pygmies are very small. And apparently in like the the deep jungles of like the Congo and whatever, they're actually like Bantus are hunting pygmies down and like eating them along with other kinds of monkeys. So that seems like very ghoul-like behavior in terms of real life. I'm just, I'm thinking of, wasn't there, wasn't there pygmies in Madagascar at one point? Could like, be. like we will have to read up on why exactly do monkeys eat each other? Is is it because they lack protein? Is it because it's a, it's a good question? Why they do that? You know, because like hum- for humans, it's like oh well, we lack protein, or um, we like we do this out of like a ritual. You know, isn't it like uh, with chimpanzees? Don't they do it? Uh, it's chimpanzees and baboons, but aren't they just naturally just vicious fuckers anyway? I mean, I mean, compare them to bonobos, for example. Like your bonobos will have, uh, I guess, like comparing the two bonobos, I feel are a lot better in the sense that they're a lot more chilled out. I mean, they they shag yeah. each other a lot, yeah, but they're a, but you know, they're, I mean, they're... it's an evolutionarily like incorrect thing to do because cannibalism almost invariably in most species results in terrible diseases so mm. animals who eat you know others of their species would essentially die out die out because as to, i said it causes diseases to aid to aid in that point uh, you've got like different ant species in the uh, in the amazon um when you've got like uh, army ants and whatnot you've you you'd have like different hyper aggressive species but all of the hyper like super aggressive ones made themselves extinct because they would fight each other to the point you know that they would just wipe themselves out mm-hmm. so uh, i mean army ants migrate yeah but they um not as aggressive as they can be and for good reason like they can be super aggressive but in doing so it is detr- mm-hmm. detrimental to the yeah. survival of them yeah so so when it comes so when it comes to aggressiveness there is there is kind of like a, a limit to between aggressiveness and survival um, um one thing i just looked up because i was curious i wanted to read about kuru again yeah. and the uh, papua new guinea people that did that thing of eating their deceased relatives they actually developed a resistance to prions like it's not 100 percent or anything because obviously they mm-hmm. they get infected yeah. and die but compared to a normal person they're much more resistant to that kind of disease, yeah. which is pretty interesting. Surely, surely a cure can be synthesized from that. No. Right. Okay. <laughs> like outright, that's not how prions work. <laughs> like the only thing you can. Oh do yeah, is yeah. It's a pr- it's a prion. Yeah. Literally. Yeah. Literally, it's in the brain. It's. No. Um, it's it's a it's a folded fucker in the yeah. It's not a disease. It's not a virus. <laughs> a folded it's, protein. Yeah. Yeah. 
a fo- <laughs> it's a folded fucker in the brain that's just there going. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to explain this to, to the audience. How Prion works is oh, it's yeah. essentially a, a incorrectly folded protein that is resistant to nearly anything. It's it's a protein that's like like not fold almost not folded at all, and it's like resistant to ha- mostly high temperature. Uh, it's resistant to like acid to to bases on the, besides like very 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 strong bases. So it's essentially near impossible to get rid of them. And once they start accumulating, and you know, takes them a while to accumulate, but like they will eventually kill you. Like to to kind of uh, get <laughs> to help people visualize this, you know, uh, and going along with what we've been going on about when it comes to apes, you know that one scene in uh, Rise of the Planet of the Apes where Caesar's got like that twig and he snaps it in half and then he like gets the two of them together and says, "Apes together strong." Yeah, it's like that, but with prions. When the, once they're folded, yeah. they're the kind they're kind of like a Nokia tele, uh, you know, they're like they're like a Nokia brick phone. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and, and 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 um. They keep on multiplying, and essentially the uh, the brain matter because the the you know neurons can't really get replaced easily. Mm. Uh, so like the more the more uh, n- the neurons are hit by those prions, the more uh, your brain dies out and you get like a neurodegenerative disease. Uh, it's not that they don't hit other tissue; it's just that the other tissue can regenerate itself a bit better. Yeah. Isn't it also true that they're kind of like converting other proteins yes. in your body? Yes. Yeah. They basically talk they basically like like touch and then they do like a thing uh where they, they essentially unfold the other protein. It's like and that so, fucking... so they multiply kind of like, like a virus, but, but not so really. they're kind of they're, they're like the zombies then, aren't they? Yeah. Of single yes. single, single cells and whatnot. Yes. yes. They're, so, they're like so... yeah, protein zombies. And that you can't kill them. Oh, uh, what's 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 that meme? Like so and so is the powerhouse of the cell. <laughs> the uh, mitochondria. The, the mitochondria yeah, that's, that's it. is yeah, the but... powerhouse of the cell because it produces uh, the ATP, which is the energy. It's <laughs> not for medical podcast. God damn it! Look it up on YouTube. <laughs> Brian, so Brian's are the zombies <laughs> of the cell. Oh, yeah. Brian's are the zombies of the person. <laughs> I'm getting a little lost. Oh fucking hell! It reminds me of like dark matter or whatever you know how like uh, maybe it's not dark matter but there's some matter that touches normal <laughs> matter and it converts yeah. it into yeah. itself oh no that's that's no antimatter if it uh connects with real matter uh it blows up. Anni- un- sorry sorry annihilates itself with a burst of energy there was some other space thing that that converts other stuff that hits it i don't remember what it was dark uh Black hole. No, no. <laughs> I so wait, it's a space, it's a space thing. It's a space thing that hits another thing and it converts it. Yeah, it's like some weird thing where, like, if you had one fucking atom of this stuff and you put it on the Earth, it'd like rapidly transform the Earth into some kind of weird space thing that's like completely different to normal space things. All right, I can answer that one. I can answer that one. Scientology. <laughs> yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean. I because exactly because it's in space, because Earth is in space. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, I don't think we have the uh, capacity to explain this to an audience, but long story <laughs> short, there's such a thing out, out there. Yeah. Um, it's just, you, you can trust us. We're, we're, we're a bunch of guys on the internet. We, we wouldn't tell <laughs> lies. <laughs> you, you, should, you should look it up. That's. that's oh, fuck no. Okay. Uh, go. <laughs> People, people, people vote for ghouls, and, and we've gone, we've gone from ghouls. And... <laughs> so I know ITZ wanted to cover uh, ghosts in world build. Sorry, ghouls in world building. <laughs> yes, yes, I do want to cover ghouls in world building. All right, strap yourself in, fucker boys. We're going in for a wild ride. <laughs> All right. Okay, so ghouls are typically depicted as flesh-eating undead, yeah, similar to zombies. Despite mm-hmm. this, the two have varying differences, right? So unlike the zombie, ghouls are more athletic. And, you know, the, uh, this this is more for combat purposes. Uh, they're more athletic, they can serve a more agile combat role, so they are absolutely perfect for guerrilla warfare, right? You're not worrying about going to Vietnam and having some Charlies and Trees, you're worrying about going to Estalia with your big boy Gelt 
and getting completely fucked because a bunch of ghouls are in the trees instead. So they can serve as scouts, assassins, and like you know, like every other undeads, they can break morale. And especially bonus points if you get a ghoul, a ghoul there munching on someone's uh, munching on a leg or an arm or you know, like trying to get into someone's skull, that would also break morale. Um, so they've got a more com uh, bestial, like as Chep said, they've got a more beastly component to them, right? A proper beastly component to them. So meaning that they are a lot more animalistic to compared to other undead. So this, so this can be used for writing and world building to make ghouls difficult to control uh, completely because zombies have their own instincts usually in regards to like they will, you know, they they are just moaning and groaning and shambling about. They've got no clue what they're doing. They just want to. They just want to McDonald's. They just want to munch on somebody. That's 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 their sole purpose. And you know, fair enough. Everybody, everybody can relate to that at some point. Um, ghouls, ghouls kind of take it a bit more to the extremes, though, because like with with they're not unintelligent in in a, in the regard of a zombie. Like they do have some, even if they are undead, they will have some modicum of intelligence, which can or some or some kind of like uh, better instinct that can enable them to do uh, better things to satiate their hunger. So. Um, there can be that should somebody like uh, an necromancer or something along those lines control a ghoul, then it can be story or world building that the ghoul would, could resist or follow its own direction. Like the person can be in control of it, but lose control every now and again because the ghoul is trying to do its own instincts. It's it's a bit of a, a bit a bit of a lovable rogue in that kind of sense. Yeah, it's I not think... like a mindless puppet that's got its own initiative. No, no. Yeah, I, I think it would be more like the necromancer gains the uh, support of the ghouls because he's the one who deals with death, with death, and he's the one willing to go all the way to the margins to deal with the ghouls, and essentially he's the only one from like on high who wants to deal with them, mm. from like the, the proper society, if you can call a necromancer that, you know, who wants to deal with them. So he naturally becomes, in a fashion could become some like their leader. But what could be interesting, in my opinion, in world building is um, re like redeeming ghouls somehow. And I don't mean just like redeeming ghouls as a thing, but more like making the ghoul stop his flesh addiction or, and, and somehow turn them back. I think that would be an interesting arc to take the players on. on Very Dirty. interesting. Uh, the only thing I can think for that is you got a guy and he's, and he's there going, Dave? <laughs> Dave, Dave you, you're a ghoul, mate. No, 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 Dave. Here, have a Snickers. You're not you. You're not you when you're hungry, mate. Here, eat it. Better, better. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to think of what could cure a ghoul, and all I can think of is just a great big massive stick of broccoli. Just, just eat a munch on this. Yeah, I think it would be like the same way that you would cure a meth addict. It's like you keep them on a on a meat of veggies. And just like lock them up and um, try to, to get them off of the drug. So, but this is basically yeah. So basically, the best way to cure a ghoul is the same way that you'd rehabilitate an addict. That'd be interesting. But, but do you think you can actually like um, uh, fix it like that, or do you think he's just like it's like a permanent irreversible effect? Because doesn't their physiology change to a certain extent? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I mean, like, can you? How should I say? Theoretically, like if you cure a meth addict, even one that has been really far gone, right? They have bodily damage, you know, that that the, the body is damaged. You can cure some of that, not entirely, but I, I think you can do, like, deal with some extent to a ghoul. The thing is that you cannot, or at least in most cases, you cannot 100% cure addiction. Once you are addicted to something like alcohol, etc., etc., it will always be there in your head. It will always be there. Like if you take that one drink, it can spiral you out into uh, addiction yet again. See, I've had this. I've had this conversation with a friend multiple times, and he and he's told me many a time, and I agree with this. You can't cure an addiction. Yeah. You can deal with. You can deal with it, and yeah. you can replace it with something else. Yeah. Oh, yeah. uh, I don't think you can replace it for very long, but yeah. The thing about addiction, like I read up a lot on it, 
and it's basically a symptom of another problem like the the alcoholic is drinking because of some bad shit in his life that he can't deal with and he needs that escape yeah so isn't yeah. it also isn't it also to sort of like um this substance or this addiction is being used to replace something that's missing from yeah. that person's life like it's 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 there to satiate uh something that's yeah n- not there normally or there is, is lacking there yeah is but also... once you get addicted uh like replacing that thing is not going to fix it usually mm. yeah there's like two components to addiction there's like the physical addiction and then there's mm-hmm. the mental addiction i can give a pretty interesting story about this actually i had an yeah. operation and they gave me this oxycontin stuff have you ever heard of it uh yes but go on it's basically I... like uh legal heroin and it's like a painkiller and you take oh, it orally. please do go on <laughs> yeah you take it orally and it really cures the pain and it's pr- it's a pretty fantastic um medicine but it is incredibly addictive and uh... what happened was is that my body got addicted to it but my 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 brain wasn't so I was a kid at the time and my mum told me, okay, you're not having any pills anymore because she was like concerned about it and whatever. So I like ab- abruptly stopped these Oxycontin painkillers. And it's like, I felt hungry all the time. Like I had a constant pain in my stomach. Like I was really hungry and we didn't know what it was. Like I'd eat heaps of stuff and I'd still feel hungry. And I was just like generally like really like just upset and we didn't know why. And then we went to the doctor about it and he tells my mum, no, no, you can't just take them off it. You have to like wean them slowly off it. So like I, I took the Oxycontin pills again and like within like less than an hour, I was totally fine. And then I slowly weaned off these tablets and now I'm like, I was totally fine after that, like no more physical addiction. So that's like a weird case of being physically addicted, but not mentally addicted. So that. it's it's the body the body mm. craves it and requires it and yeah, yeah, and it yeah, doesn't really weird. know what it actually needs because if the mind doesn't you know know what it took per se, uh, and and it's I mean what you were actually craving for was you know human flesh, <laughs> we, we yeah, of course, know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, so you were you were a little kid ghoul for for a little bit there, yeah. But like, imagine if you've got both. You've got the physical addiction, and you've also got a mental addiction. That would yeah. really fuck you up because you have all I've these. Said, I've said this multiple times. I do think that we as a society need to rethink how we look at addiction. Like, because because sure. typically when it when it when it comes to uh, addiction, most people have the mindset that oh no, it's it's the per- the person is at fault all the time regardless of, of circumstance or life issues or mental health issues or anything that could happen the person is at fault all the time and they should be abandoned and left and that and nothing should be done to help them because they got themselves yeah. into that problem what why should anyone else pay to save them but the thing is is that that's it, it not pays off, it pays off to to help them for mm. the society mm. essentially yeah, yeah. And and not only that, but when it comes to when it comes to addiction, people will do it for different reasons. And you would tend to find, isn't it the case where you'll have people that are sort of in more poorer areas that will be uh, that are more statistically more inclined to be addicted to something because you know they're poorer, they can't afford uh, certain luxuries, or the, or there will be a lot of stress, so they need to have something to help them actually it's survive and get through it. It's a cool podcast. It's it's not addiction podcast. <laughs> not True. Specialist. An addiction. But back on the rails, I guess. Yeah. For specialists. <laughs> <laughs> like, I've, just, I've just been confused. I don't know what to add it here. I'm just going like, eh. <laughs> um, yeah. should I move on to the next like thing for the sort of goals in combat? Yeah. Uh, so they've got uh, so they've got more bestial component to them. Uh, this yeah. So the uh, blah, 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 blah. oh so sorry. Take, so, oh, I have one more world building point. Ooh, um, I just remember. I just remembered it then. I wanted to say it earlier and I forgot, but it came back. No, no, it's just go, 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 go. So basically, if you're a necromancer who's in need of clean minions, if you've got like a half living kind of ghoul, it's not like a zombie where it's rotting. You could theoretically yeah. give it a bath and then use it for tasks that require sanitary stuff, like maybe farming or something. 
That sounds way too wholesome for a necromant. Like, that sounds very wholesome. Not <laughs> yeah. Lie. And the second thing, honestly, ghouls are way too high maintenance to be doing, like, farming. Yeah. Like, you would put them on way more complex things. You can leave farming to the skeletons. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I can give an example of ghoul farming, um, and this is a this is a uh, this is a, a couple of quests in World of Warcraft. Basically, you've got a area that's essentially Alcatraz. It's a mix of Alcatraz and Auschwitz. Um, or already we're going there, and bas and basically a bunch of uh, Forsaken, which are undead. Um, you, you know the, the those ones are being left to their own devices, and there's a quest where you find a shovel in a field with humans that have been buried up to their necks and only the heads are exposed and you have ghouls jumping from person to person eating the heads so you can either use the shovel to free them to free the humans and save them or you do the right thing and smash their fucking heads in <laughs> now any reasonable horde person would smash their fucking heads in <laughs> <laughs> but um but yeah, you do have like ghouls jumping around. So if you have if you have a ghoul that's doing farming, I can't help but think you would either ruin the farm or you'd come back to find it's completely either destroyed your vegetable patch or it's gotten loose and is attacking the rabbits. Yeah, I guess they're way too bestial and wild to be used in such a way. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um Should I move on to the next uh, point for the Yeah. Alright, so something to take her into account follows along with the lines of ghouls being more or less of the same durability as zombies. Ghouls are still undead, although with with with, with this podcast we're kind of that's in, you know, that's mix. It's it's either alive or dead. It's one or the other, they are either alive or they are dead. Wait a minute. Um <laughs> ghouls are still uh, still dead, only more agile and, you know, beastly. This can both hinder and help them as they can stop mid combat to eat a body or find themselves unable to perform their regular movements due to severe damage to the limbs or body. So with them being quite, you know, agile, having extreme damage to the limbs can really mess with them because they you're not gonna have a ghoul for a tanky sort of role. You have that for you have that for zombies. You know, they can shuffle together in big hordes and whatnot, and they serve really really good like that. Ghouls ghouls can be really good as hit and run um minions and units and whatnot so they can go in and do some damage fuck off rinse and repeat so having so having a destroyed limb that can severely hinder their movement can really mess with mess them up to the okay. point where at that point um it may be better to just leave them to crawl into the com into combat and just do whatever they can before they're eventually killed um, and with them stop it, if they stop mid combat to eat a body, this can both be good because it can break morale and can scare people and whatnot, and bad because it means that somebody can easily just come along and bash the reds in. Um, one thing that I think ghouls are really good for that you can't do with zombies and other kinds of undead is that because they're like kind of sentient and they've got their own, like they can take charge of themselves. I think they're a really great set and forget unit. Like you could just have them doing guerrilla warfare against some settlement or town. Yeah. And yeah. you just like you don't need conscious control over them like you do with zombies or skeletons. You can just mm -hmm. kind of like, okay, I'm sending the ghouls there. They can just do their ghoul thing, drag the townsfolk out of their homes, eat them at night, scare everyone shitless, and I'll just focus on the actual army while these guys are doing the harassment. That yeah, that 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 sounds like a good plan. Um, sh now, should I move on to the uh, ghouls and world building? Because because that was ghouls in combat, so this is going to be ghouls and world building. Should I? Uh, let's let's skim over this because we've been going for I believe almost an hour. All right, didn't so... we already do world building? I thought we already did it. Yeah, uh, this is a little bit about it. No, uh, this building, essentially. In that case, uh, can I mention just one point in this uh, little thing then? Like one specific point, because I, I do quite like this one. Yeah, sure, go for it. So, right. ghouls have certain similarities to Wendigos, right? So you've got Wendigos, which are seen as evil spirits that in popular media are created from the consumption of human flesh. So there are already, you've got similarities between the two. So historically, um, this has uh, been like, in, in stories and whatnot, this will be like you you have uh, some explorers going into say Greenland or around wherever in a frozen area 
and dwindling supplies and being away from others means that cannibalism will happen and then it kind of goes on from there i think isn't there isn't there like a an adventure game called um what's it what's it it's not dead by daylight it's the one it's the one where you where you've got a bunch of typical american uh people and i i know which one um yeah one of them becomes a wendigo and then it goes on from there yeah Let's yeah it's I, I really want to say something about the characters and that, but um so yeah uh historically this was due to people justifying cannibalism under belief that the person was becoming or had become a wendigo so already you've got that you've got the mind um changing or, or adding to this situation to justify it to make it a reasonable or to make it a logical thing to justify the act itself that you know so they, they can't control themselves and those and so therefore ate human meat the difference is that ghouls are more typical but uncommon and they seem more or less everywhere when the ghouls are typically reserved in freezing and cold climates so you so for world building you can use this to have like different ones for different areas you've got uh, a type of ghoul that the vampire coast have in warhammer uh, you know like you know like morn ghouls the the water ones yep yeah, so, you, so you so already you can have different types uh reserved to different environments so you can have like freezing ones normal ones water ones you could you could even have ones in more volcanic areas yeah. Uh, so um, you, yeah. I, mean, I mean, the Wendigos are pretty straightforward for like why that happened. I mean, there was uh, it's it's like re resources in the north are scarce, so you need to have some kind of story to prevent people from you know eating each other, mm. right? Because they would be afraid of becoming those terrible ghosts. It's which which is in its in itself a cautionary tale, but for completely yeah. different reasons compared to a ghoul. Whereas a ghoul is more sort of sin and all of that. Uh, when the goes are a lot more well similar when the when the, when the goes are more in the case where this may happen do not do it yeah again the talk cautionary tale thing mm. yeah. um am i okay to mention like the one last thing that i do kind of want to we are currently at one hour and eight minutes and some of that was like just rambling and stuff that i'm going to cut out like mm. just off topic stuff so I think we're mm. good to go for another ten minutes or so. Yeah. So, All right. I'll, 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 I'll be I'll be quick with this. So so high can do his uh, can do his stuff. Yeah. Um, so basically, basically ghouls are generally unknown when it comes to fantasy. Like uh, people like uh, Ursula will know about it, and people watching this will know about it. But to the broader audience, ghouls aren't really that well known. This can be both good and bad. Good because you can expand on them and do whatever you want with them for world building, and bad because. You know, it's it's a good. You're gonna have. You may have to explain it, and you may have to sort of like put emphasis on it. But the thing is, uh, compared to other undead, why would you want to go with a ghoul as opposed to something else? So people can always like and dislike it in equal measure. So there's a lot you can do with it because with it being unknown, it does add for a lot of variety. You can do it in so many different ways compared to zombies and skeletons, which are more traditional and uh, always are stuck in how they are, regardless of how it, you can add in change things to a zombie or a skeleton but it will still be a zombie or a skeleton at the end of the day ghouls can be are a lot more malleable yeah um so so yeah that's 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 me done so uh, do you want to do your point so high uh sure although one you somewhat uh touched it was like um is there a reason to choose ghouls over zombies or husks like what is there like a tactical value or like the reason why you, tr you uh, choose them over another certain situation Maybe the one I described earlier about having like these kind of free agents that you don't have to control, just like harassing people in the woods or whatever. Yeah. I think mm, that's the but, main benefit. Yeah. Oh, well, well, that's one thing, but at the same time, we'll just be able to just say, uh, tell a zombie to go around and roam around and be able to do the same tasks. Yeah, but zombies are quite slow. I mean, ghouls with their more bestial agility and whatnot, like they, they can. Worse. Sorry, zombies are slow, but they also have very like limited intelligence. With yeah. a ghoul, it's more like a spectrum. Like a ghoul can be very bestial and very not in control of itself, but you can have a ghoul that's totally, you know, in control of itself, just excluded from society. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. And I feel like ghouls are a good mix uh, of like between zombie and skeleton because they're not as light skeletons, they're not as dumb as zombies. They fill a nice uh, niche when you need something a lot more agile and hard hitting than a skeleton. They can climb trees, they can they you know, they've got like a more of an apish sort of 
uh, thing to them. So they can climb trees, they can swing, they can do this, they can do that, they can jump around, they can leap, they can attack people, they can run the world. They're very good for hit and run and gorilla stuff. Like that, they they can be very very useful for spe- for specific situations. They're also capable of reproducing themselves in some fantasies. Like there's the thing about the ghoul curse where whoever they kill rises up as another ghoul. Oh yeah, yeah. Overlord has that with Death Knights uh, turning people into ghouls when after they kill. Oh one. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Age of Wonders has it too. Hmm. Uh. Okay, um. Oh, I just like had a, made a bit of like realization with the ghouls, like thinking about it and uh, looking at back and more. I feel like ghouls, like it's not that just feral. It's pretty much their uh, like um instincts like their primal instincts turned to overclock to the point where it's an unhealthy obsession like there are certain people who just have like like um uh their instincts go haywire the ghouls are just have their instincts go overclock to the point where they can't control themselves or they can't do anything else aside from their instincts if they're getting crushed but as long as they're tr- getting their kill they don't care it's just their instincts yeah. up turn up to a certain point where it's like a perversion of nature which i feel like is one interesting aspect Hence, why the the notion of of kind of portraying them as in a way addicts. Yeah, because... the addiction must be satisfied. Rend to the flesh. Yeah, of like flesh eating as like that they need the flesh so very much. They have so much hunger inside of them that uh, I think analogies to addiction can be made if you want to make for interesting storytelling. Yeah, it could also be quite comical in the sense where they have a deep thirst for man meat. God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ding dong. Meat's back on the menu, boys. <laughs> Boo. You know, right, I was Jeff, thinking. Um... Sorry, go on. No, 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 you you go, you go. I was thinking they're kind of similar to orcs with Sauron, because you know, like Sauron and whatever other Dark Lord, like they have these orcs, and while they're around, they're able to control these orcs, but. When the the Dark Lord, you know, is no longer around, like he had his finger cut off, the orcs just do their own thing. And I think that ghouls are kind of the same. Like, a necromancer can pretty much just establish some ghouls somewhere, forget they even exist. The ghouls are doing their own thing, surviving, whatever, reproducing. Maybe they get killed off by humans, but maybe not. And then when the necromancer returns to the area, then he's got this army that's ready to be used. Um, isn't that touched upon a little bit in Shadow of uh, Mordor and Shadow of War? Possibly, uh, in the sense that you got you got like the Bright Lord, and he, you know he's he's uh, like branding pe- uh, branding orcs and turning them to his side. But if he loses that ring, or if he like loses that, doesn't he also lose the control of all of those he's turned? And don't they do their own thing afterward? I haven't played uh... the game, so I don't know. I have uh, played the game to completion, even got to the little secret ending, or it's called. It's oh, yeah, kind of yeah. disappointing. Um, yeah. I think I'm trying to remember. He did lose the bright ring and then had to get a new one, but I think he still had control over his Uruks. I think it's just they were just uh, given a uh, complete allegiance to him. I mm. think it's just like sort of mental thing because remember, uh, actually, wait, this is a spoiler if I actually do say this. Should I say it? I mean, so, you've already said it's a spoiler, so people can always just stop right now. Yeah. Okay, uh, so this is going to be the spoiler for the next one minute or two. Um, halfway through the game, uh, you're betrayed by one of the uh, people who came up to assist you, uh, as well as the guy in your ring. He's like, yeah, okay, I know you want revenge against Sauron, but at the same time, I don't think you complete the task. So he basically has the one girl uh, who is like Galadriel's blade, or it's called, have her backstab you. You're left to die. But then you take the, the Witch King's ring and use it for yourself. You come back to the city of Mordhal, I think, Minas Morgul. Uh, and then, yeah, Minas Morgul, yeah. Yeah, Minas Morgul. You must have you just... in your head. This is Minas Morgul, and you are but one man. <laughs> oh, I am one, but we are many. <laughs> and just summons up the, the fucking uh, army of Gondor. Like, the, uh, the, the spirits of Gondor. And from that point on in the game, you are actually able to commit necromatic feats. It's not as in-depth as other uh, features. It's basically, you kill all the orcs, and then you can just fucking raise them all as a group. So pretty good, though. Oh, yeah, no, that's still fun as fuck. Just, I love hack and slashes, and just be able to raise them all as fucking undead minions. Mm. But, yeah. Mm-hmm. It, yeah, it's 
he he still has dominion over them, but I'm pretty sure that eventually gets put over to Sauron's uh, side once he eventually converts to one of the fucking ring race. Because that voice was always in his head with the ring. It just eventually made him convert. He held on for fucking years, but the annoying thing is he eventually fell to the ring. Yeah. Maybe to close this podcast as the final kind of question. What would you guys personally, as necromancers, use ghouls for? Uh, I would use them... Uh, I'd use them for reconnaissance, scouting. Um, I'd use them for vandalism, uh, vandalism assassinations, um, morale breaking. You, I feel like you'd want to use them, uh, use give in to their nature, like their be more bestial, uncontrollable nature and urges, and essentially use that to terrorize the enemy. In this, uh, so as in, uh, you can you can say, for example, you're fighting against an army. Every army has to be supplied, right? So you've got supplies going to the army. Where are those supplies coming from? Farms, um, agricultural, animal, you know, livestock, animals. You can have ghouls as individual agents of mayhem sent to these places with the specific purpose of causing as much chaos and anarchy as possible. They can ruin and poison the crops. They can kill and disembowel the animals. They can attack the people, make more of them, so on and so forth. And while you're doing your own thing and they're doing their own thing, it all contributes to the end goal of winning that conflict. So when it comes to them, you can safely rely on them to give in to their own nature and rely on that part of them to uh, satiate what needs you want from them. I think... I would try to use them as, like, the foundation or some meaningful part of a necromantic society because they require human flesh to sustain themselves. You can use this to manipulate them and control them. And, you know, the fact that they are so single-minded in their addiction makes them pretty good minions but they're also like intelligent enough at least some of them maybe intelligent enough to like be part of your society and Imagine because of that uh, i i believe it's like for the for the if you want to go for like long-term sustainability that's what i would use them for it's like i would use them as some form of like uh like middleman in my magical you know necromantic society Imagine, imagine having like a ghoul just stood there on the side of a road with a sign that says, "We'll work for flesh." <laughs> Wait a minute! <laughs> oh god! <laughs> Fuck! <laughs> Ding dong again. Um, I'm, so. I'm trying to think. I would probably use ghouls as more of like a um, like a second wave because I would probably like send in my first uh, first in couple of zombies as like part of a raid. And just send them in to see, test the enemy's defenses, maybe even have a, a try, uh, kill a couple of few, leave some corpses around. Not enough time or be able to get close enough to actually like mess the corpses. But with that, you can send in the ghouls. You know what the defenses are. You know where to place them. You can uh, make send in other types of dead help help them out. But you're pretty much sending in mostly the ghouls because they can go in. They know you know which points to rush now. Not to mention, there are a couple of bodies left over from the previous battle. It, it basically allows him to be able to sustain himself for a longer period of time compared to these zombies. One problem I mention, see with that is, um, imagine you've got your necromancer army, right? And you've right. got your standard units, zombie skeletons, you've also got ghouls. Wouldn't having a pack of ghouls eating all of the dead soldiers you've just killed, breaking their bones to suck the marrow out, kind of remove a resource of replenishment from your other forces like if you've got a whole heap of broken bodies it's not really useful to make zombies and skeletons from that anymore i mean yeah i i acknowledge this but it's also because it's just like the um the second wave of the ghouls they probably get die out eventually but because there's like some still bodies around it allows them to be able to sustain themselves uh, for a bit longer time while within the walls and you can't really just you can't really go over there and be able to just use those sets of bodies just yet because like they're, they're the um the living's defenses are still going strong you've only basically tested out what's going on the um i'd say that the ghouls are more like shock troopers to see, just make them uh freaked out a little more surely uh chap with you with what you said there 
non necromancers can use ghouls for anti necromantic means as in if the bodies are too broken to be of any use then it deprives the necromancer of a good resource so it's good for asset denial when it comes to warfare so that's true in a so in a battle in a warfare in a war of attrition the necromancer won't win because these ghouls you know are being paid in flesh by these other people and they're being used to, and they're being used to break the bodies so badly that nobody can use them afterwards yeah they're probably not going to do uh, ghouls though they'll probably just find some other means of like a um like a beast master finding sort of creature that just only meet, eats man meat it's just fucking huge so it just takes out all those bodies it's like yeah those are no longer for you or just set fire to them yeah 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 i guess as my closing statement like what i would use ghouls for is pretty much just what i described earlier i wouldn't have them as part of my main army because i think they're a bit too uncontrollable and you can't really equip them of anything like maybe you could but you know they, they just want to use their claws and things typically so i would just have them as like some kind of harassing force that i can just leave causing terror somewhere to soften them up or distract them or whatever and then move in with my main force and do the actual kind of heavy lifting work so i guess that concludes our ghouls podcast Thank you very much, everyone, for being on. I hope you enjoyed yourselves. Thank you for having us. Thanks for having us. Thank you for having us.